welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And I'm here with somebody that I have known a long time, got a lot of respect for, probably cost me more money than most people that I know because I buy everything this guy creates. It is, of course, <laughs> one and only uh, Dave Loosely. How are you doing, Dave? I'm good, mate. Thank you so much for having me on here. Honestly, it's uh, I've been watching and they're fantastic. So to be a part of it is, is brilliant, mate. Thank you. I'm honoured. Like, seriously, I'm honoured because you have been, like, you are you are one of the good guys in magic. You really are. Oh, you do you, things ethically the right way, and you are a creative force. Even if it's not something you've created yourself, you're, you're an expert at taking something, tweaking it, oh. and then making it even better. I'll tell you, before we even start the interview, I haven't even told you this, but I just learned a trick that you i called it the loosely touch in in the review <laughs> it's an older one now do you remember camouflage with oh the, my gosh uh, yeah yeah the, yeah the thing right okay so i watched that for the first i missed it when it first came out i watched it right. years later um mm. and i loved it but you know the thing that made that the color right. changing deck oh, yeah. then it was just a packet trick right yeah, then, yeah, yeah. And, and that's all it was. But then you, you very nonchalantly on the download, you were like, yeah, but I thought it'd be a good idea to do this. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm staring at the screen going, hey, that makes the trick because without <laughs> that, there's no ending. And, and that's what I call the loosely touch. It's a, <laughs> it's a trick. That's <laughs> cool, man. Proving it. You know, you just, you have this habit of taking something and just making it so much better just by thinking about it. And it's... Oh, bless you, man. Well, it, it happens by luck a lot of times, to be honest, because I think that it's important that you just create to, to you, you know? And we all buy tricks online, and quite rightly so, you know, it's it's the way to move forward. But I always, when I get a trick, I'll, I'll watch up to the point where I, I find out the method, and then I turn it off. And I just think that's a really good way to do it because then your mind starts going, okay, so this is how it works. How am I going to make this suit me? And because you haven't got, and you haven't been sort of funneled to, it does this and this is how you're going to do it. You know, let's take a Svengali deck. Everyone thinks, okay, so the card goes in, you can make it come to the top and then the whole deck changes to the same card, right? Because that's how it is in the written instructions. But there's so much that's been done with that because, you know, it, it's a utility but you just got to look outside the box. And I think I just try and do that with tricks to suit myself. I'm trying to remember the name of the trick now. It's a Paul Harris effect. Um, deep astonishment. Yes. You it, made yeah. that deep astonishment. You made that so much better. <laughs> Thank you. That was something that people kept like, were really sort of putting down that effect. And I just, found out the method for it and just sat down and had a look at it and I went well what, what can I do with this and I love the um the biddle uh was it the biddle trick that I added to it I think it was that yeah. and they just worked so well together and then people started just buying the trick and it was all over the cafe and that was just because I, I looked at it and sort of you know done it to me and uh and then he, Paul Harris gets in contact I've never you know I'm like this to Paul Harris because growing up, is the gimmicks are like it's just you look, you were waiting for that next Paul Harris effect, you know, you're like, when's it coming out? Uh, and then I get like an inbox message from him. I was like, whoa, okay, you know, can we feature it and use it on the on the download? And then from there, it was yeah, I think it sold really well for him. And um, and mate, like, and that, and I didn't sit down and say I'm going to make this trick better or more practical, whatever you want to call it. I just sat, sat down and said, how would I do it? You know, before watching. And then afterwards, once I've got my idea of how I do it, I'll play the rest of the, uh, the download. And, you know, you will match up at some points along the way. You go, okay, so we went down the same route there. But then you've got this one thing that sat here and you go, I haven't done that yet. And it gets towards the end of the video and you go, okay, so that's kind of, that suits me, it's unique to me, I guess, with their trick. Let's go with that. And that's how I, I tend to take other people's effects. Or... But that's such an important thing to do because you see in magic, hmm. a lot of the time magicians will buy a trick and go, 
oh, that's not very good. That 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 that's not very good. And your that, that deep six or that deep astonishment is the perfect example because, like you said, everybody was panning that. And yeah. You were, rather than jumping on that bandwagon, you were like, well, actually, how can I make this better? And I think that's that's something that more magicians should learn how to do. You know, take the trick and make it their own mm-hmm. rather than being the same generic copy that every other magician in the in the world does do you know what i mean i I definitely agree i do definitely agree and it is something that you know even if it isn't the trick itself it's the way that you the words you say the way you perform it when you bring certain products like items out and even just putting together like structuring a set is, is a personal thing there might not be your own effects you, you could do stop ball effects the whole way but the way the stories you put behind them the way that you transition from one to another that then makes it you right and we all we all have that draw right i mean you could see i've got like 10 of them uh full of magic crap right and not crap right the reason i say crap is because that's our assumption that wouldn't work for me i throw it away but there's something about that that made you buy it yeah there's something about it that even if it was the heavily edited video where you saw no sneaky moves and it says this is what you want it to be and this is what you think you're receiving, you open it and go, oh, well, that's not going to suit me because that's nothing like what I thought it was. Well, that effect you saw got you interested. So what's in the box? Okay, the end result. So I can get to that end result. But how am I going to get there? How am I going to make it more practical? Because that wouldn't work in this lighting or that wouldn't work out in the streets. So how can I make it work for me? And then you just start the process, you know, and it might be that it goes in that drawer again. And when you're ruffling through again, you go, I had something here. Let's work on it. And because you've read five more books between the two times you looked at it, you've now learned more methods that you can delve into. And suddenly you then produce something out of something that was sat dead in a drawer. Um, and and that's something I like to do and and play with and yeah recently I've really got the the bug for magic like the creating bug back and I hit a real stale point for about a year where I I was trying to force ideas and they just wouldn't come you you know it's the worst thing you know to sit down and try and force them it just doesn't happen and the more you force it the more wrong direction you're going because just sort of just forgot about it for a long time and then now ideas start to come and you know you walk around the shop and you can't have you go for a food shop but you end up down the stationary aisle because you're like hold on i can do something with that you know what it's like so um but yeah it's all a process and that's for me is my favorite i mean i love performing but i love just sitting there trying to come up with little ideas and stuff so. and and i want to pick up on something you said there which is really important which is sometimes you look at something you put it down and you come back to it later on. Mm. I, 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 you know, sometimes people will look at something and they'll, they'll try and force themselves into making it work for them and creating something. Well, sometimes it just takes it. Have you ever done this where you, you look at something, you've got no clue, you walk away, you come back a couple of weeks later and now you've got the solution. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And it's almost like it's sat, sat there just at the back of your brain without you knowing ticking over just waiting to match it up with the thing it needs and then suddenly it'll click and you go oh my god why didn't i think of that earlier well you are thinking about it but subconsciously yeah yeah 100 percent. and um it, it's a it's a fun it's a fun exercise i mean for, for people that have seen any of my sort of um the downloads of creative collective thing that i did like the, the process I like to do is a few processes, but one is go to a, a pound shop or a dollar shop and just literally buy random stuff and, and throw it in. Now I say random, as I'm picking it up, obviously as I'm scanning, my mind is going, what can I do with that? What what, what, what could that be? Oh, it's, it's a bit shaped like a ball. I could use that. That's a bit, oh, that could possibly work as a chop cup. So I'm not trying to reinvent the will i'm just trying to say what methods do i know and how can i jump outside the box with those methods the props that aren't sold in a magic shop even though the method is and the effect is the same if that makes any sense but yeah that, that's a process that i like to kind of go down and and it's become very successful you know um 
something we were talking about earlier started as that process and a long time ago and with the ball bearing and then it started to move on and now it's changed into something different so where you start isn't where you end and where you end isn't the end because in a, a month or two that might be you know slightly different objects or you know it's, it is fun <laughs> you know I've, I've spoke about this on the channel before but being a creator is kind of like a holy grail to a lot of uh, magicians or people that are new into magic because we put we put the creators of magic on pedestals and yeah. kind of worship them. So everybody wants to be a creator, uh, but not many people can. Uh, or the ones that there are actually anyone can, but there's very few that can do it well, um, which is why we see so many terrible downloads. Yeah. Any yeah. advice? On, on, on creativity beyond what you've said. So you go into your shop, you get mm -hmm. your stuff off the shelf, uh, you, you're thinking through ideas, you come yeah. home, you've got, a, you've got a carry a bag full of shit. <laughs> where, do, where do we go from there? Where we've got, we're sitting at our kitchen table, yeah. surrounded with a load of stuff from a pound shop. Yeah. Where do we go from there? Where do you go from there? So first of all, I, I don't, um, and I'm not trying to be humble in saying this, I don't put myself up with the great. So, or even near them, okay? I, I just, I'm putting you up there. Right, okay, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, the reason I say that is because I think everyone has their own personal way of doing it. And, you know, I, I'll sit and be in awe of creators and go, how the hell did they just come up with that? That's such a sort of, like, I, I would never go down that route. And that's that's why I sit and I'm in awe of that. And then I guess I'll do that for myself and someone that wouldn't go down my thinking pattern would go, oh, that's nothing like, oh, that's a matter. How would you come up with that? And so we all have our own unique way of doing it. And for people, when they say, oh, I could never create a trick, you, you definitely can. And it doesn't have to be a, a trick. You know, so many tricks are, are regurgitated because there's only so many effects, appearances, vanishes, transpositions, you could go and name them. There's, I don't know how many there are. There's probably 10 or 15 that, that actually most tricks fall under. But how do you make it suit yourself? So, okay, let's imagine them. We've got our tat on the table. All right. Um, one thing, if you it's your first time you've done it, grab, I mean, now we're slowly coming out of uh, isolation. You'll be able to meet up with your friends more, but grab another couple of minds creative people or even not creative people but friends in magic you trust and just throw the stuff on the table and just start talking okay because all this is is, is i mean i've got tar bell back there um i read through that regularly all the time and i've come up with some great stuff from tar bell there's a uh sorry i'm digressing here but there's a, a torn and restored paper napkin routine that that i do and, and you can play on the biggest stage with just a couple of napkins and uh, i absolutely love it. it it mixes slidini's paper balls overhead with a torn and restored and with a sucker effect that gets the audience uh, as well as the person on stage and that came from a, a torn and restored napkin that was in tarbell so i think you need to feed your brain with knowledge and that takes time okay but and you can't speed it up but just enjoy the process, right? And once you've got that knowledge in your head, now when you put that tat on the table, it will almost start to happen in, in your brain. You will look at something and go, well, that, that looks like it could be, yeah, that looks like it could be that. And that, oh, I just learned this trick the other day. Or what about if I tried it with these um, two little frames instead of cards? Or maybe this could, you know. So now you just start to... And, and, and there's no wrong answer, okay? There's no wrong answer. You have to try just everything. I've sit there, one thing I've done, I've thrown a whole like um, brick of cards on the table. I've emptied a brick of cards and, I, and I've got a pair of scissors, glue um, and, and a cutting board. And I just start, one thing I did, I just put one on and I just went at a weird angle with a cutting knife across um, the card and it gave me this odd shaped card, stuck it to the back of another one. And through that process, it cre I created this really fun rising card routine that I do. And the gimmick it was 
you know made that way so it it isn't an easy process to explain and anyone that that tries to tell you this is how to do it you know that works for them you know i one thing that i've always given in my lectures and and said is that i i look i look at creating like a race but um you you don't have to be quick to win it and instead of starting at the start line you start at the finish line and the reason for that is because you need to know where you're going in order to get there so let's say i want to do a um a rising card that uses no magnets no threads no nothing okay there's my end line now I go to the start line and we're going to hit hurdles as we go. Okay. And each hurdle you get over, you're going to get closer to that, that goal, but it could take a really long time, you know? So that's how I approach it. And sometimes I'll give the end goal and say, I want to create this and it will take me ages to get there. And other times I'll throw a load of tap on the table and I'll go, Oh, holy crap. I can do that with that. That's brilliant. That suits me. And, and yeah, it's all about trial and error and just, not forcing anything, getting the knowledge in your brain for as much as you can for moves, slights. I know people love a gimmick, uh, but I really do recommend, and I don't like to, not that I don't like to read, I find it hard to concentrate reading and always have, but I've forced myself to, to read magic books and the knowledge you get from it is invaluable. And I think without it, I wouldn't have been able to create the magic, you know? And one other question on creativity before I move on. Hmm. You said that you spent about a year where you really struggled and you were kind of in a creative funk. That happens to a lot of magicians. Hmm. Um, any advice on how you got, because obviously I know from speaking to you off camera, you're through that and then some. How did you get through that sort of creative block? Is there anything that you can do? Uh, or is it just a case of taking a step back and, hmm. and kind of hoping that you get back to where you were? There was massively halfway through it, you know, and um, I'm not going to say you feel depressed, but you, you feel a bit like just down because if that's something you really enjoy doing and you think, oh, I'm never going to create another trick. Do you know what I mean? You get into this thing, you're trying to start, you throw it down, all the stuff's there and nothing, you know. Um, so I think it is about just being, taking that step back and not, try not to think about it for as long as possible. It might take a week, it might take two weeks. For me, it took over a year. And then suddenly I was in, um, I was in the pound shop, <laughs> pound stretcher, uh, and I was, I was walking around and I saw some bits up on the wall and I go, oh, that could be really cool for that. And that, my God, why didn't I think of that before, right? So then I took it home. Um, bang straight away I'm like right start you know and, and, and I'm starting to get that feeling back of excitement or going oh because when you do create something even if I'm not going to sell it I mean there is drawers of stuff with just stuff I've created that probably won't ever see the light of day but it's been but the process of getting that to that end point is like amazing like it, it's so exciting so then I started to get the buzz back then I would start to actively look more for random objects and things and put myself on um you know uh, you know an amazon you can lose yourself for a week on there just trying to search things so you, if you type in um i don't know let's take a random object giant paper clip all right and then whatever comes up on amazon you, you you flick through have a little look you might see something that is massive you might see something that's slightly bigger and this is one i did before, so I took a um, uh, a big paper clip and then visually it turns into a normal size one as you drop it. Uh, and this is something that's on uh, my Instagram. And uh, I was creating a thing for Instagram, which was um, uh, called See What I See. It was a See What I See project. And it was all shot from my eyes. And so now that was a new way of looking at magic because normally what I see is what the audience shouldn't. Okay, if I'm doing anything funny or dodgy with car or whatever so now when you flip it actually i need to see the magic in my hands this side so i set myself that as a project and that's something that i'm going to start picking back up again as well because um i think i've got something like 16 or 17 videos up there and uh and then i didn't manage to uh have the time to do it 
but again i've got that spark back and last week i was like oh, there's four more bits actually that i could do for see what i see so i think it's setting little goals or projects that, that to get excited about uh, and then just sort of looking outside the box you know go the extra mile search random things right you, you never know what they're gonna bring you to and also think about everyday things how can you make uh, a 18th century ball and vase uh, more up to date with a, a few packets of sweets or do you know what i mean like how, how can you make this more you uh, i think that's important that's fantastic advice now You've just given a masterclass in creativity and I haven't done what I normally do in a Thought Magic interview, which I do want to go back and do because I think it's very important, which is just find out a little bit more about you yeah. and where you came from in terms of magic, just in case there's people watching this who haven't heard of Dave Loosely before. Yeah, uh, sure. I can't imagine that there are anybody out there who hasn't heard of Dave Loosely, <laughs> but just in case, uh, let's, let's just set the scene and very quickly talk a bit about you. And okay. let's start with your origin story, Dave. What is your origin story? When did you get into magic? Was it an uncle that pulled a coin? <laughs> no, it wasn't actually. <laughs> um, my, my origin story, I have said this a couple of times and people are like, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is how it worked. I went to a kid's birthday party, a friend of mine when I was like six years old. And um, there was a magician. He made a rabbit appear in a box. And all the kids swarmed around the magician to stroke the rabbit. And I went to the box. Yeah. And I found this, like, I found a secret. And from then I was, I was amazed. I was like, oh my God, there's things going on that I didn't know about. And I just, yeah, my mum said that from then onwards, from the day after that birthday party, it was every Christmas, birthday, anytime I was good at school, you know, it was magic, magic, magic set, magic set, magic set. And, uh, from then onwards, it just started to build, you know, I had a huge love for performing arts when I was younger. So especially in high school, uh, I was in all, all the shows and they had their version of like Britain's Got Talent. Um, but it was it was a, a variety show really in the school and I would get involved in all of them. And then it just started to progress. Uh, I found the Young Magicians Club um, at the Magic Circle and I was there right from the beginning to 18 and absolutely loved it. I mean, we, we were rubbing shoulders with people that at the time I was like, some I didn't know and then went on to be like, oh my God, I've met them. Uh, I was rubbing shoulders with Paul Daniels. So we had teachers come in and some amazing magicians like Will Houston would come in and teach us. We had um, Ali Cook would come in and teach us. And loads of people would just be coming in and it isn't until you start to get into the magic that you understand who these names are. And you go, oh my God, I, I learned from them when I was younger. And from then, yeah, joined the magic circle and, and the rest is history really. And I think, uh, was it 2000 and, what was it? was it 2005? I think I released my first trick, uh, which was squash. And that kind of introduced me a bit into the creating side of it. And I just got the bug from that, really. So, yeah. So I want to I want to pick up on the Young Magic Circle thing for a second, just because there's a lot of people that watch this channel um, that are younger, uh, 13 to 18. Um, mm -hmm. Also, there's a lot of people that watch this that are outside of England. With right. what's been happening in the Magic Circle now, would you agree that no matter where you are in the world, it's worth joining the Circle and the Young Magic Circle? Hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. And if it was a day later, I bought the frame and everything. One thing I've always wanted to do was frame my magic circle certificate, right? And I've never had a room to put it in until now. Um, so I've literally got it all ready to go with the medal in it and, and all of that. So because I'm I'm a really proud member of the magic circle, I can't wait to get back down there, um, you know, and to to learn and to hang out with everyone and possibly even share you know teach it. I just love it I love it there and yeah being in the young magicians club which is the magic circles youth initiative um it was just I mean we, we had free reign of the headquarters on a Saturday from like 11 till 4 and we'd be up there in the theatre which is amazing if people have never been 
and I, you know one of the first stages I was on performing magic was the magic circle stage as part of the youth initiatives and I remember a good friend of mine Joe Derrington we did a double act together for a number of years uh, we won three awards in, in the show uh, it was Jay Day um, and I need to find it as well I, I got awarded do you, do you remember Peter McCann? Yeah. Oh, an amazing magician. Um, I used to be in awe of him from Monkey Magic when, when that was on TV and Pete Berman. Uh, so I got the, the very first award that was awarded um, on his behalf. And I'm going to get it up on the wall. It's a lovely plaque and it's a picture of Pete pretty much oh. in his fluorescent flowery shirt. And um, I'll always remember that, you know, just not really expect anything out of it but if I learned anything from it it was that the tricks were okay but it was all about the performance you know and that's what I got from the performing arts side of it even in my close-up when I walk around I do close-up magic it's a real it's a exciting I've seen you work and, and you take the same leap I think it's like it's a powerhouse comes in this it's not just a guy doing some tricks it, it's a performance it's like a you create your own stage with these people and that's that all comes from you and the words you say how you say them the little quips the jokes knowing the timings knowing where to stand with people how to break the barriers you know and and that all came from performing arts that all went into the young magicians club then i started to build who i who i am as a magician and now that's gone on into me now into the magic circle moving on so yeah, if people haven't heard of the Magic Circle, you can now join overseas, and I highly recommend it. I did an interview on the channel with uh, Bob Pound. Uh, really oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, he's the man to, uh, he's the man to impress, I'll tell you that. <laughs> if, yeah. if you I made this <laughs> interview calling him a gatekeeper, and he gave me a 15-minute lecture about how he's not a gatekeeper. I was like, okay, sorry, Bob. All right. <laughs> Consider myself old. Yeah. Um, no, he's a good guy. He's a very good guy. He's a really so, good guy. Yeah. Smart. So you joined the circle, you joined the Young Magic Circle, you joined the circle. Mm. When did you start gigging professionally? Um, mm. was, it, was it before 18? Was it after 18? When did you start doing gigs? I think I did my like first paid gig for like 30, 40 pounds, whatever it was, a, a rotary club when I was like 14, I think 14. Um, but when I was 16, I worked at, uh, at Chesham World Adventures theme park, right? And I was one of the guys that stood there and tried to uh, get people in to play the games, the balls in the bucket, you know, Tin Can Alley, all that sort of stuff. And I used a lot of what I learned in performing arts to build a show, pretty much. You know, I could juggle, so I would just be juggling, I'd be calling out and, you know, almost hassling hustling by sort of being like so what's your name it, it's that say there is no way on earth you'd be able to play this game so keep walking right and and like just sort of playing rather than standing just waiting for people to come you know you I, I was just sort of playing with people and that very quickly sort of led to me carrying my cards with me into work when I was down on my breaks I would be showing your person a trick and soon word spreads and like management starts to find out. Then they had me walking around the park on a hot summer's day doing magic for 10 hours, right? For minimum wage, but it didn't matter at that time. It just didn't matter. You know, I was, um, whatever it was I was earning at the time, seven, eight pounds an hour. I was there for 10 hours in the beaming hot sun, walking up and down the queue lines for the rides that exceeded like 40 minutes. So you'd have people in the vampire which is a roller coaster ride notoriously known in the uk as like the one that's going to cause the longest queue so i think it was something like 110 minutes or so i would start at the back of the queue and i would get a group of people i would start doing some magic move along with them then i would get to a certain point and then go right away to the end of the queue again and start working so the people near the front never really got to see anything but they're near the ride so that's okay Everyone at the back got a bit of entertainment. And to go from doing sort of the odd gig to, I must have worked in my ambitious card a good 60, 70 times a day, 
amongst other things and um, being told to off uh sometimes you know go away we don't and and it really was my stomping ground to be like wow okay this is how i deal with people this is how i've got to learn very quickly how to deal with people um and we were collecting we're doing it on behalf of their charity which is called merlin's magic wand um and yeah so we were walking around with a bucket as well so i remember it was it was the most sort of like humbling moment when <laughs> we'd done about three hours and i was like how are we doing they're like i've got a couple of quid i was like okay great um you know so i'd work my ass off and like we hadn't raised any money because we were like put in what you think it's worth and like no one's putting anything in so I was like, okay, I need to change what I'm doing here. I need to play more for the crowd. I need to step back a bit more, get rid of the cards and play a bit more, almost like a street show. And that was the game changer. I'm now playing to a huge audience each time. I could do three shows in a whole queue line and cover the back, middle and front, all from just playing out more than than hopping, right? So we could sort of almost go into a, a parlor show from a close-up show. And that is where I started to learn how to interact, how to how important eye contact is, uh, audience management, all of that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, then I'd, it, I've been invited back many, many times since to do their big like yearly, um, it's called the stars award so every person that works there has the opportunity to get it's like an incentive you get this huge party at the end if you're a good employee pretty much and uh, everyone wants to be there so I, i've done a huge like one hour show there many times keep getting invited back and that all came from just doing starting with ambitious cards and starting to learn how to work for that corporation and i think if you take that into the magic world and you, you've done some huge uh, gigs for some massive companies, Craig. So, and you know how to tailor them to the, for those people and how something for this company wouldn't work great for that company. And you know that and knowing that is, is the magic. It's the real sort of the key to it. And uh, I know that now for, for the Chesham over Like, so it, it's, it's, uh, hopefully I didn't digress too much there, but that that's kind of how I got first into performing and getting paid to perform and from there gigs came from it I was allowed to hand my business cards out which is one of the biggest places in the world to hand out well not in the world but in that area there's thousands of people walking through that uh, park every day and I'm allowed to be like this so it took a couple of months and I started to then see gigs coming in off my own back and then from that more self-publication and then more gigs coming from that and then you just start started to build the clientele really and that's that's how i got into it that's fantastic i mean that's absolutely amazing one thing i want to pick up on and what you said there yeah is you talked about you know uh close-up magicians and when you're performing close-up magic going up to groups and i think that's something that a lot of people that are new into magic mm. they struggle with because all of the books will talk to you about this opening trick and this yeah. opening trick and on the forums you hear people going what's the best opener for my act what's the best opener for me how can i open up this or but really the thing that you need to learn isn't th there's no holy grail trick that's going to make you a superstar it's no. the ability to walk up to a group cold and yeah. within three or four seconds get them to stop having a conversation that they were probably interested in, yeah. listen to you and want to watch your magic. I mean, it's a skill that a lot of people overlook, but yeah. I think it's more difficult than any magic trick. 100%. Oh, man. And the anxiety I had early days of interrupting people was I'd feel sick about it in the corner of a room. I'd be like, oh, God. I get to the end of the gig, I'd take whatever it was, you know, 50 pounds, whatever I was taking when I was a teenager. And um, I'd be like, oh, I don't want to do it again. I can't do it again every time. And then a few days would go past and I'd go, I know, but I love it. And I've got a gig coming up. So I, I am going to do it again. You know, let, let, let's do it again. And, and then you you hit another wall <laughs> and you, you're in the room again. You go, oh, God, I've got to interrupt these people. And, but it all comes and there's, there's no easy way of doing it at first because 
you know, I just explained it was horrible, but you have to do it to understand how to do it. And when you understand how to do it, you don't even think about it. It becomes second nature, right? It's like, it's just part and parcel of it. And there are there are some lines, there was a line I used for a long time and I'd love to quote where I heard it, but I can't, I just don't know. If this is your line, I love it, thank you. And I've been using it, um, but I've been using it for so long that I can't remember who I heard it from. Anyway, it you walk up to them and you go, um, and, and I don't do lines normally, I would just walk up and I would introduce and I would just be me. I would go for a handshake, probably not anymore, but um, <laughs> an air high five now or whatever you want to do. But uh, and I would just introduce me and and ask about them a little bit, and and then I would, I'd, I the cards wouldn't even be out, so they get to know Dave before they they know I'm a magician, right? Mm -hmm. So, but the the line I used to do is, "Hi, my name's Dave. Um, I've been hired to come and interrupt your conversation. How am I doing?" And then, and then it always gets a good reaction. They go, "Yeah, pretty well." You go. No, I'm here to have some fun with you guys. What's your name? And then you're in, right? So that's a line I've used. I can tell you whose line that is. Yeah, go for it. Is it yours? No. <laughs> Greg Wilson. Greg Wilson. I know you just had Greg on. Right? Asked the question to Greg, and he said, Let me tell you the line that I use when I go up to a group of people. And he said, Hey, my name's Greg Wilson. I'm here to interrupt you. Yeah. How am I doing? How am I doing? There you go. That exact line in the interview with Greg Wilson. It's a Greg Wilson line. There you go. So I, I, I went to Greg and that makes sense because I followed Greg's career from day dot. Like, oh, I remember at Davenport's, they had lectures in the, in the back room there, the little stage they had lectures and Greg Wilson uh, came and lectured there and it was, it just blew my mind. Like it, from then on, I was like a fanboy of like all of his stuff, just loved it. So that makes complete sense as to where the lines come from. And boy, is it a good line. And, you know, you deliver it, deliver it in your way that suits you. You know, I have a certain point where I, I time it before I say it and, and it rolls and it suits me. But um, it might not suit you. But I don't really use it anymore because I don't need to. I, I'm just far more comfortable with, with rolling up to people and just sort of just having a chat, making a comment. Maybe somebody's wearing something, I comment on that, or there's a drink that I like, or whatever it is, I come in and I say, yeah, I, I don't know, I can't tell you what I say, because it's, it's different for everyone. Um, but that's what makes that group remember you. Because if I went in and started saying something I said to the last group, but it doesn't apply, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, so that's cool. I've learned something. So Greg Wilson, and it's an amazing line. Um, and if you don't know the name, check out everything he's done and check out his interview with Craig, because I'm sure it's great. I've only just started watching it. So um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't even get to that point. Or I would have come and said to you, I've got this line from Greg Wilson. <laughs> awesome. The cool. other thing I want to pick up on that you mentioned mm. is you talked about uh, learning audience management. Mm. Um, any tips, you know, as somebody who's performed at a high level for a very long time, any tips on managing an audience? And, 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 and because you are right, what you said, it is such an important skill mm. that you see a lot of people struggle with. So you know, do you have any advice on ma uh, audience management? Yeah, I think, um, again, it will be individual to your style. Because I can, and I know you can as well, Craig, like if you're starting to get heckled, you can hold your own because you know what you can get away. You know where the line is. You know how to how to tiptoe on it and not go over it. Uh, and, and that again comes in time. Uh, so uh, you know, I've got no like set advice for for sort of handling hecklers because that is a very it's a personal thing as to how much how far you want to go, how you want to handle it to suit you, but. Management wise, if I have to get somebody on stage, for example, um, for anyone that's seen my penguin lecture that I did, is it, some of the stuff I'm most proud about. And comments I get a lot, people very kindly message me, inbox me, and say, Oh, no, I love the show. Da, 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 da. You, were, you were so lucky with that uh, spectator, right? And I, I hate it sometimes when. <laughs> I know I've actually worked for that. I've scouted the room. I've watched the performers before me. So Dan, Dan Harlan was on 
doing his stuff for the Tarbell course that he does. And in every show, much like I did there, I stood and I watched the audience, okay? I don't know if you've ever been to a magic convention, but sometime in the old days, uh, Blackpool Magic Convention, the gala show was about nine hours long. And uh, there's the same people getting picked, right? And almost to the point where, you know, he's been up four times and you, he's had all the jokes done with him. He's got his, who he is as a spectator across. And now it's almost a bit boring that he's back up there again. Do you know what I mean? Um, sometimes you see it, people come out, they pick the wrong person, they ruin the act, they ruin the show. It's all about them, me, me, me as a spectator. And that, that can be hard work, right? If you haven't dealt with that. So my advice, if you're in a show, or even if you're walking, walk around, just walk and just watch for a bit. Just watch the room in a close-up environment. See who's the alpha male on the table, okay? See how they're reacting and think to yourself, can I handle them? If not, I'm gonna go nowhere near them. I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna pick someone over this side or I'm gonna position so that my right shoulder is actually uh, he's on my right shoulder, so if 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 anything, I can actually almost block him out uh, if need be. Do you know what I mean? And and then little tips where you can control the room from where you stand, who you, who your eye contacts with. Because if I'm opposite him, my eye contacts to him. Yeah. If I'm even over this side, my eye contacts to him. So if I'm worried about him or her, then I'll go and position myself next to them and pick the person. So now left of me gives my eye contact to this person gives this side then they can see it she's picking it here and gives this side a perfect view actually if anyone doesn't get the, the great view it's him and if anyone wants to see it and actually be like oh excuse me then now he's coming he's working to me rather than the other way around so that's just a, a little tip that i use for for reading room but over time it just naturally happens. You just read a room and you go, oh, you know, someone might crack a joke and someone reacts amazingly to a really bad joke. And you go, oh, she's going to be brilliant because she's going to, or he's going to react. So I'm going to try something on them first. So they're little tips, but that lady from the Penguin Show, um, I, yeah, I scouted her. I saw how she was reacting to Dan. I was almost going, oh, please don't pick her. Please don't pick her. Uh, there was a little break. She went to the restroom and uh, that was near where my dressing room was. And um, she goes, oh, do you know where the restroom is? So I thought I would try. I went, I think it's that, that way. Where are you from? And she goes, oh, you know, she was local. So I hired. She goes, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from London. Yeah. And, and we got chatting and I, I could feel the vibe, you know, that she was reacting great. So I was like, she's going to be the one. I'm going to pick one person, have them up there for the whole half hour show. And she was the one I picked and she reacted she, she, she tested me, but that's what I wanted because I know that I can react to things that are being said. And I know that the real magic happens when it's not scripted and when it's in that moment and for that room, it feels electric. And that's, that's what it's about is creating that moment. Like you can watch that and go, oh, that was good, but it still won't feel how it felt for us in that room because it was, it was like, you know, you know, when you go, you get the American, American people always say they've got great reactions and they really have. Um, I think they're just more vocal than the Br British people. And uh, the room was electric and I'll always remember that show. And I'll always thank myself for, for taking the time to watch the crowd and pick her because uh, still people say, oh, she was brilliant. And I go, yeah, she was. And I, and I made sure she was up there with me. So it, it, it is that you have the say at the end of the day. And so yeah, just a couple of little tips, really. That's really, really great advice, mate. It really, really is. Uh, I think reading the room is so important. Absolutely, 100%. This, yeah. for anybody who's, who's listening to this, I have to tell you, this is a masterclass that Dave is delivering now on how to be a professional, successful entertainer, uh, magician. What you're doing, the information you're giving away is brilliant, I have to oh, tell you. Right. Well, no, if I, yeah, if I can give anything, because I used to love sitting there. Well, I still do. I love sitting there, just listening and absorbing. And um, 
you learn from mistakes as well. You know, I, I've had so I've had many mistakes. Yeah, trust me. Um, none that I, I think of. We're in the day of uh, YouTube when it was all hot. Otherwise, it probably will be, <laughs> be all over YouTube. But you got to try. You got to make. Um, you know, uh, take chances with your magic as well. And uh, otherwise, you got to fail. You got to fail to know. And that's the best way of learning to know what not to do and and to move forward. But yeah, if I can give any advice before you have to fail, then hopefully you get something out of it. And, but what yeah. you just said there is very important. You said you got to fail, you got to fail forward, and I think that's important. Failing isn't a problem. Mm. Uh, everybody fails. It's the only way to succeed by you know screwing up over and over again. Yeah. But it's learning from that, you know, the what that as long as you a failing, but then you kind of go, well, what, what, what can I learn from that? I'm not going to do that again. So what am I going to do next time? I yeah. think that's the way that you need to be fail forwards. A hundred percent. And, you know, also, um, I don't want to be controversial in saying this, but if you find yourself in a magic uh, convention or with other people that do magic, I always, uh, when I try and show something new, I like, I hate it. I'm seen as a bit of a name, right? So people just, unfortunately, will just like what I do, even if it's rubbish, okay? And that, unfortunately, that has happened sometimes. Um, and I was doing a show, and afterwards, everyone was like, oh, it was great. Da, da, da. I got the footage back, and I was like, oh, you know, I flashed there. So if the camera saw it, everyone saw it. But I want people to come tell me. I, I saw you flash at that point and because that's the only way that i can get better it genuinely is the only way and so i recalled um magic as, as much as i can in a in an environment like this when i'm practicing to to see angles but it's never the same when you're out in the real world and so i think people need to be more honest with each other in uh, when hanging out with other magicians because i we're all friends so i'd much rather have constructive criticism that I can learn from than someone just blowing smoke because then uh, I don't see myself as being up here I still I'm still learning there's still so much stuff that I don't know that others do and even the, the top people in the game there's still stuff they don't know right because no one can know everything so I, I, I still want to learn I still want to progress as much as I can at the same time I want to teach what I feel um, I've learned and want to share or created but yeah I think that it's really important to just be a bit more honest when watching there's no, an example of this I used to mentor a lot of the young magicians club and um, I saw it happen all the time someone would do like a, uh, a double or a pass right and I mean you know Stevie Wonder could have seen the pass but the the person that's watched it has said oh it's great and so this person now believes that what he or she did just there was great. So they'll continue to do that. And they're not going to learn or progress from that. Yeah. They're actually just going to continue to have people saying, like, yes, men saying, yeah, it's great. Oh, brilliant. But magicians are more concerned about showing their next thing. Oh, it's great. But have you seen this? Right. And now this person's going, oh, it was great. Oh, okay. I'll continue. I don't need to work on that much more then if it's great. And this is like the, the subconscious uh, monologue that, that happens. And you see it a lot, you know, and some people don't like being brought up on it. But for me, it's, you know, I'm not saying come sit in the front row at one of my shows and say, oh, hey, mate, you, you know, but afterwards come talk to me and, and say, you know, this is wrong. I did a, a show in London and uh, I thought I smashed it. And the lay audience loved it. A magician comes to me and said, the lighting that you chose on that rope routine you did uh, was really bad because I was only halfway in the audience and it and the light sort of like shot out. You couldn't see what you were doing. And I went, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that. Okay, brilliant. So now every time I do that routine, I get somebody to watch it from the back, middle and front row while I'm doing it. Uh, and now I don't have that problem. And I wouldn't know that. I'd have thought I'd smashed it if that magician hadn't told me. So, yeah, you know, it's 
I don't know how we got onto that subject, but, but yeah, just a bit more honest with everyone. Yeah. You know what? I did a, I did a rant on this uh, on the channel. I, I, I talked about magicians need to be more honest with each other. Right. And, and the point I made is that we don't want to create bad magicians. You know, we can, it's, it's like you say, you can, prefer, if you, if your yeah, friend yeah. performs something to you and you say it's brilliant and it's absolutely terrible, if they then go out and show a lay person, they won't be so kind. No. They'll probably say it's not very good or they'll say oh, that they'll be polite about it, but yeah. then they'll go away thinking, I hate magic because that's the problem with magic. If you see a bad magician, you yeah. instantly hate magic. You don't get that with a singer. You don't see a bad singer and think, well, I hate music, but yeah. it happens with, with magic all the time. And the only way to, yeah, the only way to make sure that that doesn't happen is by creating good magicians. And yeah, that, that comes from and, being honest. And seeing a magician is, is a lot more of a rarity than seeing a musician. So someone's going to, if, especially if you're hanging around London a lot, you're going to see singers far more often and you might just see a magician once. So that's the one opportunity and one shot that that magician's got to make an impression on these people, to make them go, I love that, or I hate magic, because then it'll just tarnish, like you said, the whole thing in general. I hate magic now, because that was rubbish. So yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You are right, and it is important, but yeah, it's people just, I think that we are just friendly. Like we are a friendly community. At, well, we, we can be a friendly community. <laughs> Um, away from the magic cafe everything's great. absolutely yeah i mean i was thinking that you said it so that's right <laughs> um yeah 100 percent um so i i just think that we need to be more, yeah we need to be more honest and and go go with that and actually just accept it and and look at it as a good thing you know right i'm not being horrible here but i saw you do that what if you just tilted your hand a little bit that way and brought a bit more into you and try it and I'll film it for you. That, that, that's what I'd say to people. Um, and I don't want people to think that I wouldn't have it said back to me. Do you know what I mean? I'm not walking around like the big I am saying, you've done that wrong, do that. I just feel that if I can help make that look good, just by him tilting his hand and bringing it in, why not tell him rather than walking around and, and flashing? Do you know what I mean? But yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, we've got to the point in your career where you're basically outperforming now, you're a professional magician, you're doing yeah. gigs, uh, things are going from strength to strength. And I know throughout your career, you've performed every type of magic you can possibly imagine. You've performed stage, you've performed close-up, you've performed corpora, weddings. Uh, for a while, you performed at Houdini's as well, didn't you, I think? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I still, when they open up, I'll still um, go there and do uh, do a bit. And, and I love it in there. It is like... I have that explain for me it's just the perfect working environment because you you've got people that are there that want to see magic but also they're there to get a bit drunk as well because cocktails are full of alcohol and it very quickly gets into the system um you're not there to slowly drink pints so it's uh, it's a great crowd and you do like a stand-up show as well as a close-up so you walk around, mix and mingle, and then every hour or so you do a show to the, to the bar. And it's a small room, uh, but it, it's a really intimate venue and it's and it's great. And I have literally had like Jimmy Carr ha moments of having to put people down. Like it, it's it's a really like aggressive, uh, can be an aggressive sort of performance environment. And it's my favorite thing. Uh, I just absolutely love it. Uh, when I say aggressive, I just mean people, they're not hiding behind anything. They'll say whatever they want. Um, not aggressive in the fact they're going to start a fight. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, they're just ready. They're just there to say what they want. They don't think about it, boom, because they're drinking. Yeah? And, but I had experience with this and we jumped over this. But when uh, I was at college, day after I left college, uh, I got an opportunity to go out to Rodney's House of Illusion. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I did an interview recently with Rodney. Oh, I love Rodney. He's, he's such a good guy. He's so, I just, I loved every minute of it. Um, I, I'd be, I'm a different person now to who I was then. Uh, I was still, I, I'll tell you the story behind this because I don't even think Rodney knows this, right? Um, so th th this will kind of uh, probably uh, 
Well, it might not surprise him, but anyhow, I went to the uh, interview at Blackpool. Okay, so downstairs in the Ruskin, they on the Monday after Blackpool, they uh, they held interviews. You, you'd go there, go down, show them a trick. And uh, at this point, the one routine, and this was sort of nearest the time when I was at Chesington. Uh, obviously, I'm working the queue line with my ambitious card like this, right? So I've got, at that point, in like the best version, in my opinion, of, of the ambitious card, because not just the trick, the trick is what it is, it jumps up. Every single beat was, was refined. Every single word was refined. Everything was just perfect for that routine. So, of course, in this interview, you only get an opportunity to do one trick, pretty much, or I did anyway. So I get down there, um, Matt Edwards was there, Rodney was there, um, I think Dave Taylor was there, so a few, few people, and I just went and bang, straight off the back, did my ambitious, and I just started getting everyone laughing, interacting, loving it, right? so I got the job off the back of it. So when I got out there, I was like, well, I know I'm ambitious, and I know, and, I, and I've got this stuff I've created, so I, I kind of went and did that, and we'd work the tables every night, and I was getting to the point where I was like learning beats and just getting the jokes down, just loving life, right? But I had nothing more than like these four tricks, like literally nothing more than these four tricks. And I remember Rodney coming to me and saying, right, oh, it's great that you do the, uh, the close-up stuff and that. So um, we've got you booked in uh, down at one of the hotels because as well as the House of Illusion, he runs the entertainment for hotels all around uh, the area. It's an amazing thing he's got going over there. And uh, he goes, yes, we've got you booked in for it. So it's a, it's a half an hour show. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, what? Like, literally had nothing to do. And then I spent time with Matt Edwards trying to build uh, an act up. And it, I mean, if anyone can get that footage, um, yeah, fair play to you. It was shocking. It was so bad. I, I I was literally using whatever was lying around. And I remember there was a, there was like four, a, the third hand gimmick, right? And I did, um, I can't remember the name of the song, but it was like, a, almost like the, when the rocket blasts off. Was, oh, what is it? Do, I, I, I can't remember, but it was really embarrassing. <laughs> I remember that. And I, and I would take this cloth and I'd put it in front of the microphone stand and the microphone stand would start to, to rise up. But, the first time I did it, the fucking, sorry, the legs of the microphone stand fell off as I was levitating it. So I'm just there like this, right? And of course you're on a stage where people are just walking from the bar next to you and they're just seeing this guy doing this on stage to this really bad music. But um, yeah, it was a massive learning curve for me and I was like, I need to, you know, I really need to get my act together. And by the time that I left there, um, so I remember my friends came out to see me and then Rodney was like, oh, you can go back with them if you like. So I was like, this is his way of saying, okay, we love your close-up magic, but you didn't really do very well at the stage. Um, and so from there, I was like, okay, I need to get on my game for stage because I, I really want to do it. How am I going to do it? So from there, I, I discovered um, Lee Hathaway was doing a street show in London. And I saw him do Bill in Walnut Egg, egg and lemon uh, so I started researching that and uh, Paul Daniels version and, and I got a honed in a version of that and started doing it in the Jade, um, the Ali Bongo shows at the Magic Circle which is like a Saturday night show that they used to do and yeah I started putting one trick then I thought I'd add a, an opener onto it then I'd add saying after it and then it started to build a bit more after each other. So if I went back to the House of Illusion now, it would be, I think even Rodney might be a bit like, who's this guy? Uh, so, <laughs> it was, uh, but yeah, I, I literally went out there knowing a couple of tricks, but I took the opportunity, you know, I seized the opportunity to go out there. And when I come back, I was a, a way better close-up magician than I ever was. Uh, you know, talk about getting heckled and stuff. And I mean, there is unlimited beer on the table. So, yeah, but yeah, I sorry, we glossed over that, but yeah, that was a big, big uh, sort of turning point for me as well. I mean, you've got to put yourself out there. 
I mean, talk about putting yourself out there. You've got to, you've got to do that. Yeah. You've got to do that. And and yeah. a lot of people, I've talked about this on the channel with people like John uh, John Archer uh, mm. and Matt's, Mark Spellman, but a lot of magicians, they want to go and perform on stage. Yeah. But the thought of performing on stage scares the hell out of them because there is a world of difference between performing to three or four people in a group and walking out on stage in front of 50, 100, 200 people. Yeah. There's a world of difference. And, and you can't just wing it like you're getting closer. You've got to have a uh, plan. You've got to kind of know what you're doing. For, yeah, for sure. And for me, I, I don't know why it took so long to click because when I took the magic out of it and I thought about the performance and I went back to my performing arts that I did and I did that at college, you know, I go, well, hold on, if I was going to piece together a show, which was a play or a musical, then it would, it would happen this way very clearly with the beginning, middle end and with a thread that ran through from the beginning to the middle. So what is my thread going to be? What, what is the opening? what's the middle and what's going to be the thread in the middle that, that gets me there. And uh, then I started working that out, what I wanted to say. And uh, if you see the show, it, it, it kind of builds from when I got into magic, when I was six years old, then um, at 14 doing the gig, the first gig, and then uh, into my twenties and then current day. And each trick builds from that. And then at the end, there's like a kicker, which brings it back. And um, that was very simple for me to write out. And then the hard part was then what trick will go here, there and there. So, yeah, it, it takes a time. But on YouTube is my very first uh, stage show, uh, stage performance. And it was uh, it's on there. It's, and it, you, you'll see it's me. I'm a bit uh, bigger. But uh, yeah, it was my first ever, I think it was 15, 20 minutes, and it was at Madame Jojo's, which was in uh, Soho. And it was a, a, a cabaret night, magic night, cabaret night. And yeah, I got up there and I was, I used to go to the show all the time to watch it. And I, I got to know the, the producer and I said, can I come and do a, a slot? And they're like, yeah, you can come as like a trial. You can do a 12-minute trial. Um, didn't get paid, but I did the trial, smashed it, and then got regularly booked for it. And I was working alongside people like um, Piff the Magic Dragon. And I, you know, and and I wouldn't have got that if I didn't ask or I didn't take the opportunity to do it. But if you want to see it, uh, people watching this, just type in my name, I think, and it will come up if you just type in Dave Lucy, I think. You, you'll see it. I think people haven't watched it that much because they don't, they don't think it's me by looking at the video. But um, I, I'm still proud of that first thing I put on stage, but it's very rough, like very rough. But you've got to do it. You've got to get up there and do it to have something to work towards and then to know where to go from there and how to refine it, progress with it. And uh, yeah, that well, the ending trick on that is Bill in egg, walnut, lemon, and uh, yeah, I just had a lot of a lot of fun. I think I picked a guy who was a. a I said to the guy, uh, "What do you do for a living?" And he goes, uh, "I'm personal trainer." And obviously, I'm this massive guy on stage, I, uh, so I just made like an eye look at the audience, and they all got it and laughed. And then I went, <laughs> "You've got a business card." All right, and and <laughs> from that, you just live in the moment with it. Do you know what I mean? And um, then I realised my performing arts is coming through here, and my my bantering, and just Dave is coming out, and I'm just I want a bit more of that. So then I started to go on stage and actually, you know, go a more exaggerated version of myself, and that started to become I wouldn't say character, but become my performance style. Um, and I'm still progressing on stage, like. Yeah, and to come up with a stage piece is, is that's unique is incredibly difficult. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I love it. I love it. And I just urge people listening, watching, just set yourself a goal and pick a trick. Open mic night, whatever it is, get up on there, but on that stage and do a performance because you'll learn so much from it. And from that, you'll start to build who you are on stage. Brilliant advice. 
absolutely brilliant advice. Now, I want to circle back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, which was creativity, before we wrap everything up. I want to talk to you about that a little bit more, Mm -hmm. because we haven't really delved into what you've done as a creator. Obviously, for a while, you were working at Alakazam. Uh-huh. How did that come about? How did you get a job there? Was it, uh, yeah, door, give me a job? Um, well, I, I mean, I bought magic from them, like they were my go to, do you know what I mean? Like, so I knew the name, and a friend of mine, uh, James Green, who's not a magician anymore, but they he came up with a, an idea with another friend of mine, Joe. Um, and it was like a shot glass which switched coins. And it was a really cool little idea and it was all well made, but it just wasn't honed in. It just, here's what it does, but it's a bit clunky and clinky to use. So anyway, um, Pete wanted to see it. And so they were like, oh, Dave, we're going down to Alakazam. Joe's driving, do you want to come? And I, I knew that I had uh, the squash in, in my uh, bag. And I said, like, I'll bring it just in case, you know. So, you know, we turn up and obviously, you know, you know, I'm a fanboy and I'm oh my god, I'm Zan's peeking on me. So we went into the back room and uh showed the trick, sat at this like conference table. And um I think Pete liked the idea, but he just didn't, you know, it wasn't practical enough at that time. It needed a lot of work to it. And so I I didn't go there for me, but it was there and I thought I might as well just ask that he said if anyone if you have any more just let us know I said oh, I've got one thing if you want to see it and I showed him squash which was the bottle cap which originally I got the inspiration for that from uh, Jay Sankey believe it or not uh, on one of his DVDs it's a restaurant and bar DVD and it's a green DVD I remember it vividly but he just took a bottle cap and he just slammed it and that was it and I went oh there's more to that that's over too quickly for me like it's just over a bit quick um so i i remember seeing mark shortland do an effect with a toy car right so he's got four different colored toy cars they pick one he slaps it in it looks squashed and when he kicks it out it's full again and i said that's that's pretty cool but now i i don't really suit carrying around a toy car because now i'm out you know i go out clubbing and uh you know i'm 18 19 I'm out out clubbing and uh yeah i'm just gonna put out a toy car you know um <laughs> and th- this is my mindset i think i was only 15 at the time but i still thought toy cars were too not cool enough so i was like doing it with bottle caps anyhow i wanted the end bit instead of the bottle cap to come out how it went in i thought oh, i'd be really cool if it come out squashed because then it's not only has it changed in the card but it's changed as it's come out it's now how it was almost gave another dimension to it so I showed it to Pete, he really liked it. And then that was that really. I started, I went down there, filmed a trick. I think he saw that I was, you know, a performer. And soon after that, he asked me to do one of the video blogs. So I went down there. If you watch the first nine or 10, I think it's just me. Uh, Cause I traveled down there just to do the blog. And then uh, it, one thing led to another from there and the opportunity came up to work full time. So, um, yeah, that led into that, and then we started creating magic and uh, putting all, out my tricks through through them. And you bought out a lot of tricks through Alakazam, but yeah. you also refined a lot of tricks, both in terms that like other creators were coming there, and you were saying, "Well, I I know you are because I I've spoken to you about it." You were like tweaking people's ideas and making them better, which is what I talked about at the beginning: the loosely touched. Yeah, um, which I'm now I'm now copywriting that by the way. <laughs> the least um, <laughs> very good. Um, and like you, you are responsible for Ryland's favourite trick, by the way. Uh, oh, really? Is expansion the whole? Oh, thing. I love it. I love it. So I, I, I'll give you the background on expansion. So um, Daniel Bryan, who's a great, he's a great magician, a great creator in himself. He created Gone, which is one of my favourite packet tricks. Um, he came in with the idea of stretching the hole. And um, I don't want to give away the method he came in with, but it was it was clever, but it was very gimmick, uh, not gimmicky, very angly. And it just didn't have that look to it. 
like the you know with what it is now when you flick it i mean it really looks like it moves back like it shoots back this was more of like you kind of had to shake it kind of thing like this and and then it would be back there um and i just sat there and i said i love the idea of of the stretching how are you going to make that so obviously that's another thing i was saying the end goal is i want to make this as clean as it can look okay so we go to the, the start line well how are we going to do this first off and i'm not going to give it away but it used um oh, i'll give it away because it, it's now what it is but it, it used elastic okay so it was visible and you were like dragging off the thing and then had to hide it behind your thumb right so it, it, it just wasn't yeah it was ang it wasn't angle proof it was it was clunky but it was a great idea and it was a great premise to the idea so i sat and said what if i could do this and then remove turn my hand sideways and be holding it at fingertips before i flipped it back and then that was the end goal and i started working towards the premise and i made a really shoddy looking gimmick for it and then we sent it to rob bromley um who basically made it pop back so my mine was the gimmick but it just i couldn't work with dental dan so uh when it came back and i was like this is it this is what i had in it and it's almost like you see it come into life you know and an idea that then gets put on paper that then gets made roughly and then comes back perfect how you had it in your mind um so it was a great collaboration with uh daniel bryan and of course rob bromley um but yeah, it's, and it's just looking at something and knowing, having an eye for magic really and knowing what, not just sells well, but what works. Because, you know, Alakazam, you know, they're known for creating magic that magicians use because yeah. it's practical real world stuff. So you have to have that in mind when these tricks are coming in. And we'd see tricks, you know, 15, 20 tricks a week get submitted. And, um, Obviously, you can't take them all on, and, not, and to have a very particular style, you know, it was like we just knew, or I knew, working there, like what Pete was aiming for with the style, and you know, when it came in, that you could say that's an Alakazam product, or that could be, but how do we make it more of an? When someone opens that packet and receives that that really cool thing, as well as the video and you haven't got to go and have a 10 hour uh, art attack moment you know that's kind of the premise of what they go for is that you you can open the pack you get what you need there really it's ready to go it's well made and you put the video on and you go with it and sometimes things come in that that weren't that and we were able to make them that you know and sometimes it just could have just wasn't us so you know we could, couldn't do it you know um so i really enjoyed sort of the creating the taking something and being able to just play with it and from that there's many many projects that there are my handlings of that they're on um anything bromley's probably touched really anything rob bromley's made there's a version that i've come up with but then that's what i was there to do you know um and yeah it was, it was really fun it was really you know there's so many cool little tricks and so many people I got to meet and yeah yeah really cool and I've got two questions about your time with Alakazam number one yeah. if somebody is watching this and they want to release their own magic product yeah let's just assume that it's not shit right because <laughs> wow. obviously number one is make it not shit let's just assume it's not shit let's just assume that it's good they've worked it in the real world yeah yeah checked with other people as far as they're aware it's original um they're now at a point where they want to release it yeah and they've decided they want to release it through a dealer whether that be alakazam or vanishing ink or penguin as somebody who used to vet a lot of the tricks that came through alakazam's doors yeah. to decide whether it was an alakazam trick or not how would somebody take their trick and get on a dealer's uh on a on a producer's um radar sort of radar yeah um it's a lot more simple than you might think actually it, chances are if it's if it's good it's gonna get seen and accepted and nabbed up pretty quick um there's lots of people 
that are putting their tricks towards magic shops and some people send them to all of them. So I, I know that uh, there was one I was looking at while I was there and the day that I looked at it, it was then taken by another company. So yeah, a way to do it is to send it around to all of them, you know, because chances are, the thing is like, I know by looking at something, if you showed me a magic trick and this is just, this is big headedness, this is just, I've worked in the industry to kind of be able to make this decision. If you show me a trick, I would then in my mind know whether it was best suited for Murphy's, for Alakazam, for Theory 11, for Illusionist. Just by looking at the trick, I go, well, that isn't, let's say, um, Theory 11, but that's Alakazam. Well, that isn't Alakazam, but that'd be great at Illusionist. Or actually, that is in between, but if you made it out of keyring instead of this then that would be more illusionist that you know you can look at something and be like right by t by doing this or that you can make it this or that company and then it's deciding really who you want to go with and what you want to get out of it ultimately if you want to make money from selling your product the best way to do it is to probably self-publish it right because there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes in magic shops that you don't see and there's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of people to pay, bills to pay. Uh, you know, people look at a trick and go, oh, why does it cost so much? It only uses that and that. I could buy that for this and probably make it up. Well, we'll do it because you haven't got all of the, uh, the VAT to pay, the people to pay, the bills to pay, the lights to keep on, all of that, you know, it costs money. Um, and ultimately if you want to get the best deal for your product to sell magic then you're probably best off self-publishing it but if you want the quality you want it to be done well you want the publicity behind it and you want it to be produced to a high standard then you're looking at a magic shop yeah. and also the other advantage you've done with the magic shop is it builds your profile absolutely so if you if you want to self publish somebody but know something but nobody knows who you are, that, that, that it's better to have a name first. Like you know that I mean you and we'll get onto this in a minute. You self publish now, yeah. but you've got a name. People know who Dave Loosely are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, it takes time to build it, and I would say what did I do? I did squash fused. Then I think it was miss inflection and mystique and i don't think i really started to build my name until sort of inflection and the other two were, were good um but it just takes time you know it does take time to build your name and yeah i i wouldn't self-publish and sell myself right off the back but you could self-publish and then sell to the magic shops if that makes sense so um that way you're getting the best of both worlds really because the magic shops if they like what you've got will do the sort of um uh, promoting for you you know because they they now have bought this product and they now need to move it so it's within their intention to promote it um and then you obviously have to put your outlay on the cost of the products get the product ready film the video get the videos out, the tutorials, get the packaging together. So I think if you do it once, you'll understand what magic shops actually do because people think that a trick is worth 5,000 pounds or 6,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds. They want the rights to these effects where actually go and do it yourself. Realize the investment you've got to put in before you get that out. And it's always a risk every trick is a risk you know and that's why i've never self-published i mean i've got stuff coming up with alakazam and a few other places at the moment and i've not self-published mainly because i can't be asked I, with the making of the gimmick and the doing of the this and the doing a, i'd rather just make a phone call and say this is the idea do you want it great call me when you want to film the trailer and the stuff other than that i've got my own stuff to get on with bye that's what i'd rather do i'm, I'm lazy i don't want to be fiddling and around with this crap yeah, and that's how I was for a long time. And then, you know, you as you get older, you just change, don't you? Things change, life changes. You know, you're 
your needs change, your wants change, everything changes. And actually, um, you know, putting this self-publishing, the hardest thing that, that probably is going to be the, you know, I don't have a, a post room here. So everything would be posted like it's me doing it. So you become the creator, the producer, the publisher, the postman. You become everything for that, for yeah. that effect. You know, and someone that's smashing it at the moment that is is working his absolute ass off and he's getting results out of it is Jamie Dawes. Um, Jamie is behind the scenes just working overtime and and just creating some amazing stuff. And he's doing it all from his house. He's a one man band and he, and he's killing it. And if I don't has Jamie been on here? No, but we're planning on it. Every time I try to get him, he's busy. He's and busy. then every time he tries to get me, I'm busy. And I want him on here because I'm a big fan of Jamie. I really am. Oh, I, I love Jamie's stuff. And uh, we're really good friends. I mean, I, he's one of my first friends in magic, you know, and I'm sure he'll tell you the story of how we met um, when he talks to you. But um, we very regularly chat and create and he helps me. I like the uh, the thing I showed you earlier with the loyalty card, you know, Jamie's done the art design on that for me. Um, you know, the titles for the trailer. So he, he does a lot for me and uh, he's one of my best friends in magic and he's a really good guy and an amazing magician and he's, he's parved his own way uh, within the sort of haunted, spooky side of magic, which is finding a niche in magic is very difficult and uh, he's, he's doing, yeah, he's done well with it. Really has, he really, really has. One other question about Alakazam from your time there. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll move on. So you spent a lot of time when you're working with Alakazam doing dealer stands like at the Blackpool Magic yeah. and places like that. Now I did a rant about people who go to conventions from a dealer's point of view. Because although I never had a job in a dealer, I worked the World Magic Shop stand for years. And I want to know. Bearing in mind that you're one of the nicest people I know, and I've never heard you say a bad word to anybody, <laughs> did it piss you off as much as it did me when you're standing on that stand? You've got to day three. Oh, yeah. This yeah. idiot that's come and seen the same trick 45 times over the previous three days. And every <laughs> single time he goes, I'll come back later and look at it. Yeah. I'll come back later and look at it. Let me just decide I'll come back later. And then he brings his friends and then, oh, show, show my friend. Different group of friends. He sees the same trick 45 times. He's yeah. still not bought it. Would I be correct in saying at that point you want to headbutt the guy off the balcony? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's definitely that feeling that goes on inside for sure. Um, you know, it's a, it's a hard... It's, you know, I love Blackpool because of the social side of it and, you know, we normally showcase a new products, which is fun and exciting. Um but yeah, it's it's hard work, really hard work. I mean, I have never missed a Blackpool um, since I was about 15, I think. And not working it, like, I mean, I've worked, I worked there for Davenport's, so I've been there for Davenport's uh, one year. And um, that, that, was, that was hard work because they didn't really have any products. Do you know what I mean? There's no new products there. So everyone's looking at the convention, uh, that convention anyhow, um, for the, the trick of the convention, the new thing, you know. And so having that is a, is a big bonus because then people come to you, right? Not having that is, is hard slog and hard work. But at the same time, it is lovely to see people that you haven't seen. And it's lovely for people to come up to the stand and sort of, you know, tell you what they're enjoying about what you're doing and what tricks you release and that sort of stuff. But, oh my God, yeah, just some people can be hard work. Uh, and I don't know why, I don't know what goes on. And there's only a few. Yeah, there's not many. No, and, and the chances are you probably know who you are. Um, but <laughs> they'll come up and they'll ask to see the trick, you'll do the trick. They go, oh, that's great, I'll get that. So what colour what do you want, red or blue? Oh, no, I won't get it now, I'll get it on the last day. It's when you discount it all, isn't it? Uh, no, no, it's not when we discount it all. Chances are it might sell out by the last day, but that's fine. Oh, no, I'll come back last. So it comes back the next day. 
Oh, can I see that trick? As if, as if he hasn't met you, but you remember them because they made you remember them, <laughs> right? So you're like, you're trying to be like incognito, but I remember you, so that's fine. So then you do it again, and the same process happens. Oh yeah, I'll come and like whatever. So you come on the last day, and uh, oh, can I get half price? And I was sold out, right? So off he goes. We weren't, but at the same time, like, do you know what I mean? Like, keep keep your fifteen pounds because I'd rather <laughs> I've sold enough through the day. Do you know what I mean? It's, there are some very difficult people, but at the same time, there are some amazing people, and I've made some really amazing friends working behind the theater stand. And yeah, it's hard work because the second you stop, you start again. The second you have to be mindful. Anybody that's watching this, that's planning on going to a convention in the future, be mindful that the dealers are spending three days being nice to everybody. Their feet are probably killing them. They haven't had time to enjoy the convention because they're too busy deming. They're too tired at the end of the day to do gala shows or Ruskin. They just want to go to bed, ready yeah. for the next day. And by day three, you say the wrong thing and you could... <laughs> You can set them off in a way that you really don't want them to see. Um, Absolutely. That's where I I was, uh, I should have gone to bed, but I, I just end up, I can't help myself. I'll go and watch the shows, uh, at least catch what I can. And then I end up going out until like three or four in the morning and then you, you're in the next day dealing. So yeah, it, it is hard work, but it is great fun. And um, yeah, what well, crazy, just bear that in mind. You know, you know, when you're there, the, the people showing you all this stuff have done it four million times before. And uh, if you're not going to buy it, just watch from a distance. Like, it will be demmed. It will be demmed, like, many, 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 many times. And even when you're passing, you've got that opportunity to watch it. Just watch it over someone's shoulder if you have no intention in buying it. Um, because it, it just saves a good couple hundred deaths, right? Um, the, the, I, I can, I've got to a point now, and I, I've done for a long time. You know, I did uh, Covent Garden. I did Marvin's Magic. Um, I've done Davenport's. And I've done Alakazam. I've done my whole life. Like, and I can read you. Before you even know you do or don't want it, I'm, I'm on you. I can tell from when you walk up. And I'd say my hit rate is probably 80%, 8 out of 10 people I can, can get whether I know you're going to buy or not. Um, and so just be honest. Like, it's a really, like, if you come up to me and said, and, and people do do this, and I, I genuinely appreciated it, when people were like, look, I'm not going to buy it, but I've heard it's pretty good, right? First off, how do you know you're not going to buy it? Because you might do. But if you're not going to buy it, I heard it's pretty good. Then I'll say, okay, brilliant. So do you mind just waiting one minute and we'll get someone that hasn't seen it? Because now... That person's been open to me, and I'm not going to do a dem to them and then a dem to this person. I know in a second someone's going to walk past. So I say, yeah, if you don't just, if you don't mind waiting, just, or, or come over here and see this trick. And then when someone comes, you know, because then that way you're helping us. Like, and our throats by the end of the conventions, like, like you're like, oh my God, I can't really talk. Um, uh, but it's amazing. It is fun. And of course, uh, you know, it, we're there to them. I get that. But yeah, you can help us out just that little, little way. <laughs> Which brings us to present day. Obviously, uh, you're not with Alakazam anymore. You're doing your own thing. And uh, we've gone through the pandemic at the time of filming. Things are opening up. Uh, yeah. We're seeing bookings come back in. We're seeing inquiries come back in. We're seeing things opening up, which is really great. And obviously, you've been publishing your own material. Uh, we did an interview on this channel just a few weeks ago where we talked about molecules, which, yeah. by the way, is absolutely one of the best tricks that I've ever seen. Yes. And I absolutely love it. And everyone who's watching this, if you haven't gone and seen the review of molecules, go and check it out because it is friggin' awesome. And uh, in my opinion, Dave is back with a vengeance. So my, <laughs> question, my question is, what's next for Dave Loosely, both as a creator and a performer? Because, um, like you said, you got your mojo back when it comes to creating. You yeah. hit it out the park with, uh, with molecules. I know 
the you have other stuff in your mind what are your goals is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you haven't hit yet you tell me what you got planned yeah um right so uh, it, it might change but my sort of mindset at the moment is keeping it just it's just me and i haven't got a you know a team here to to do uh, stuff so i'm going to be releasing projects in small amounts and um, at the moment exclusively through uh, my website and my email list Let the website <laughs> down there yeah <laughs> um yeah so as you go on it you'll see it'll just look like my uh you know you're going to book me for a gig but up there in the corner will say shop uh, I used to say magicians area, so it depends on when you're watching this. Um, but that's where my products will be, and the people to find out about them probably two weeks before anyone else. And as I say, I do them in limited supply, so the chances are they'll probably go once they finally get put on the cafe or whatever, and they'll be making the next batch. So uh, the best place is my email list, which is debutsimagic.co.uk forward slash subscribe. I'll put you on the email list. I'm also going to have content coming quite regularly to just those people, right? So uh, there's uh, an awesome little bar bet that I do using a gimmick that you guys probably have laying in the, in the drawer. Uh, that is, is going to be on there for free. And it's going to be that week, if that makes sense. So if you miss that week, you want to subscribe because then the next week you're going to get something else or every two weeks you're going to get something. So... It's just going to be the place to be, really, if you like my style. Uh, and I'm, I'm slowly building that up over there, so building up uh, my email list of you guys that enjoy my magic. So if you do like my magic, that's a way you can support me. You haven't got to give me any money. Uh, just support me by subscribing to my email list because you're going to be reaping benefits and, uh, and effects. And I'll tell, I'll tell you something. There's, a, uh, there's a, 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 something that I talk about on this channel. And I call it the Canadian, uh, the Canadian creator scale of quality. And at one end, you've got Jay Sankey. And at the other end, you've got Richard Sanders. And it's all about how often you bring out tricks and how good the tricks are. Yeah. You, my friend, are absolutely in the Richard Sanders camp. You don't bring them out all that often. But when you do, you know that it's going to be a massive hit. It's going to be a commercial routine that's going to work in the real world it's not going to be a pipe dream that you yeah. can only do standing on one leg when the sun is at this <laughs> angle over zoom in gallery yeah. mode only like you can do it you know you your stuff you can do anytime anywhere it's super commercial uh, it's always you. worked out it's just always brilliant oh, i really appreciate it. It, it it's something that boy i've it's always been can't call it a business model yet but it's always been how i've done it we, i've always aimed for one a year and that's because I've never had to make my living from selling magic. And I think that when you do have to make your living from solely selling magic, you start to then have to clutch at straws and, and it becomes a way of living. If I don't put out two tricks this month, I'm not going to make rent or you know mortgage or whatever it is. So now the tricks don't go through the filter. They just get thrown because they need to be put out in quantity and never to, to make the money and I, i've never needed that because i've always had a sort of day job to go with it and I perform magic um at gigs and stuff so for me i, I want to continue that I, i'm not going to just throw magic out for the sake of it i want it to be good and i was very nervous about molecules because it's the first time that i'm kind of uh, you know, there's a few bits on my site, like uh, Biddle Blizzards that I put up there, but there are, there are bits I sell at my lecture. Whereas this is something that I'm now, obviously I'll sell at my lecture, but I'm now sort of saying, right, here I am, enjoy sort of thing. And I'm very nervous about it because I know that people are after, and they don't even know why, but they like the gimmick, right? And they very quickly want the gimmick or what fools them over what works and what gets reactions and what is a real world working effect. And sometimes- I'm gonna stop you there. I know what you're gonna say, but molecules, you have gimmick. I, I think the reason that people like gimmicks is because magicians love toys. 
and they love playing with stuff. If you just get a pamphlet of instructions and a sheet of invisible thread, that's not exciting. But sure. if you get this really cool, and I think Molecules has both. I love moves. I love looking at moves and going, oh, this is really, for me, Molecules has seven or eight different things that you can do. It's got the moves and it's got really funky stuff that I can practice, but you've also got the stuff like the card that you can do straight away. That's like, hey, look at this, boom. And you've got yeah. that. I think it's got both. I think you're overlooking it. I think it's got <laughs> the gimmicks and the toy factor, but it's also got the stuff. I think it's the yeah. perfect combination of slights and routining and gimmicks. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you said that because obviously that's that's the worry when you produce, isn't it? But um, the great thing about, if you want to call it the slight, the great thing about it is that you don't need to be competent with that sort of slight. Like I've dropped. Um, I said I've dropped. I've got rid of a French drop or a um, false transfer and replaced it with what you learn in molecules because it is so straightforward and and easy. I would say easy once you understand it, easy to do. That you, that actually, if you want to learn a vanish, I no longer do a false uh, a French drop or a false transfer. I do that move, and the reason for that is because it's here you could be 360 and still get away with doing it. It is just a beautiful move and lends itself to so much. Yeah, it's brilliant. And I know that anything that you bring out in the future will be just as good, although you have set the bar very high. (laughs) That's kind of you, man. Thank you. True. Now, you mentioned one thing before I wrap this whole thing up. You mentioned lectures. Are you available for lectures, both live lectures and also virtual lectures? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've been doing, that's one thing I've been doing quite a bit actually over lockdown with the virtual lectures um, and live lectures I miss, I really miss. Uh, I, I've I've got some really cool ones lined up. So uh, there's a convention I've wanted to do for ages that have hit me up. So uh, I'm going to be doing that. Can't say it just yet, obviously, but if you want me to lecture for your club, drop me an email. Um, and the the best place to is to basically go over to my website and just fill out the form on my website and just drop it there uh, and let me know. I, I will say uh, I am quite I'm, I'm the same as creating magic with lectures. You know, I I understand why people go around and do a hundred lectures a year, and you know you've got to pay the bills and all that. But I, I'm the same. I like to kind of do a few a year I do six or eight at clubs where I'll travel out and, and do the clubs and and then I'll do a few online as well um, but again it's kind of managing time and stuff so yeah if your club would like me then then let me know we, we can arrange something but I've traveled all around I'm really lucky to travel and lecture and I love it it's one of my favorite things to do I'm sort of aiming a bit more now to, to lecture at conventions and um and do that sort of thing that's something i've loved you know lecturing at blackpool was a highlight of my career and, and i'll never forget it. it was amazing um and so yeah that's sort of the thing that i'm looking to do but a lot of clubs now are, are leaning towards the the zoom lectures which are just as fun yeah. and uh yeah you just you got to buy the trick online if you'd like but to be honest uh, again i don't i don't help myself but my lectures uh, is they're not a deal of them. There's stuff that you could do with the bits of, that are around you in your home. And then there's the odd trick that I do at the end for the last five minutes where I say, well, if you, if you want to buy a sink at the end, because that's what I like to do at a lecture, um, then, I, then I show a few bits. But yeah, my lecture is like, you'll get a lot out of it and it's not a deal of them. So yeah, let me know. Incredible. Dave, this has been an amazing interview. Like I said to you at the very, very beginning, I've wanted to get you on the channel for quite a long while. You're one of my favorite people in magic. You're always such a lovely guy, but you're also an amazing creator. And uh, thank you so much for finding time to jump on. Really appreciate it. Mate, honestly, and like, it's, it's a pleasure to do. So genuinely, I've uh, been watching these. I love them. So thanks so much for having me. No problem, man. And I am definitely going to copyright the loosely touch that's that's 
That's a new thing. Hashtag the loosely touch. Hashtag the loosely touch. <laughs> um, so no, guys, make sure. Uh, are you what you've mentioned Instagram a few times? I'm going to drop that down below as well. What's your Instagram handle, Dave? Yeah, I think it's Dave Loosely Magic. I think a lot of um, Instagram and Twitter is Dave Loosely Magic. So and check out a See What I See project as well on Instagram. Uh, you might like a few bits that you see over there. So. Amazing. So all of those links are down below and also in the description. And of course, obviously, get on Dave's mailing list, which is also here and in the description. Dave, thank you very much. More molecules. There we go. Get them while you can before they sell out. They are absolutely amazing. If you get time, go back and look at the review that I did of molecules. It is brilliant. Um, yeah, molecules rocks. Dave rocks. Guys, leave a comment down below because I'm sure Dave will see it. And if he gets time, he'll reply. And once again, thank you very much for joining me on Talk Magic. If you want to see more videos like this, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment down below. And I'm going to be back tomorrow with another three videos, one at two, one at six, and one at nine. Dave, one more time, thank you very much. I will see you again soon. Thank you, my friend. No problem, guys. My name's Craig from Magic TV.